Hi, you're, you still there? Hi, Newton. Yeah, I'm still here. Okay, so I started. So, Go ahead. I just realized, um, I thought about uh, maybe it's a good idea to update the deck list um, on your Twitch stream. Oh, that is I a good idea. I saw that you have the um, stream deck or deck list, so maybe some people can see our current iteration. That is a good idea. I should uh, I should do that now. Julian also answered uh, for my tweet, so <laughs> probably he will watch us as well. Sorry, say that again. Um, I just saw that um, Julian June Knapp re um, reacted to my tweet, so he will probably be with us as well. Oh, that would be awesome to have Julian around, the uh, the original Elf Master himself. So our audio is on stream right now, but I haven't started the the, the stream at. I haven't like actually showed my video yet. Just just as a heads up. Okay. Um, do you think it's a good idea to uh, disable the the sound of the Twitch stream for me? So we are talking um, via Discord, but I see the screen. Uh, let me see if I can do that. Probably should get an echo if I start um, enabling the sound on Twitch as well. Oh, I see what you're saying. Um, no, I think it would only happen for me, right? Because it would just hear your, uh, it would only get the echo if it's on my YouTube. So I have to disable my YouTube, um, but I think that's okay. I, I, but if the audience gets an issue, we'll, we'll know immediately, I think. Um, you yeah, can probably okay. hear on the, uh, yes, yeah, so I'm not you... sure if there's an easy way to do that. If you're on, do you also do you also use earphones or? I only you... use um, oh, yeah. earphones, unfortunately. Okay. So, so earphones are maybe the best way to disable the echo, but um, let's see if we get that. So I think it is now updated and I'll go ahead and I guess I'll start the, uh, the stream. Hey Nigel, how's it going? So I see Inigo's in chat. I'm hey Nigel, how's it going? So I see Inigo's in chat. I'm hey. Looking... Okay, there we go. I muted the what is it called the Twitch stream just in case right now, so there's no echo. All right. Um, I guess we can start. Uh, my guest today is uh, Eternal Weekend Bayou uh, champion, and it's fitting because it's the Bayou event. Uh, Elves is green black and. I'm very happy to have for the first time uh, my good friend uh, Jörg um, Heinrich on, uh, known as also uh, Aaron Relentless. So we have been trying to do this for over a year now, but just, you know, uh, conflicting schedules because of the time zone difference. 
and uh, I guess it's a fitting uh, occasion because it's Thanksgiving and we uh, Thanksgiving weekend we have a lot to be thankful for so I'm you know thank thankful to have Yorg on and uh, a brief uh, I guess intro so Yorg not only won uh, Eternal Weekend Bayou but has been playing the deck for a long time so um, yep I would like uh, to bring Yorg on now and do uh, you want to say a, a quick few words about yourself um, just so everybody who doesn't know you um, can get to know you a little bit I guess Sure, oh, thanks Newton so um, yeah good evening and uh, good Thanksgiving to all the uh, people from the USA so I'm Jörg Heinrich um, I'm 36 old, uh, years old um, working as an IT administrator at an uh, medium company with about uh, 50 employees for about 17 years for now. So um, I'm playing Magic since I am uh, about 10 and a half years old and started when the Ice Age edition was in the shops. So um, I had a few breaks uh, between that and started um, standard or type two um, as it's uh, called in the past so then later i started playing booster drafts again and going to modern and i'm playing legacy for about almost like 10 years but at the beginning i wasn't playing that regularly so um, but now it's the main format i play so i don't play any other formats at all Sometimes a bit of limited with my brother or a bit um, commander, but mainly legacy. Okay, that's that's uh, that's awesome to to hear that you're, uh, you know, I've had that journey, you know, through. Um, I think a lot of uh, other Magic players have similar journeys, like starting with other formats and then getting into legacy. I, I came from the opposite com uh, route, which is commander, ironically, but. Um, yeah, it's always great to get, I think, for the uh, viewers to get to know the actual players themselves a little bit. Um, just because, you know, you don't want just to be a name. Uh, I think it's nice to know some of the uh, magic uh, personalities and so forth. Um, I guess what I'll start off with is just answer, uh, to ask you a few questions um, now related more so to the deck before we get started um, with the replay. Uh, the format we're going to use today is for the nine Swiss rounds. We're going to quickly go through them. I don't want to spend too much time on them because it is a lot of um, matches to go through. And uh, it just I th it, it may be a little bit tiring for the audience. I'm not sure. And also, we'll provide the link. Um, I, I think it's already in the Twitch chat. But in the event that um, anybody just wants to watch the replay themselves, um, I will go ahead and... One second posted here as well for those uh, who are curious but and then we're gonna go over the top eight in detail I personally have not watched the top eight myself yet so I will be in the same boat as everybody else um, I did watch the nine rounds although like in fast forward um, speed because uh, I think that's the only way the replays are shown but I think those we can go over I took down notes and York has already seen my notes so I think there's some matches that are more interesting than others. So, and especially if the audience has a preference as to which matches they want to see, then maybe we'll do those as well. But um, I think it's nice because. So we're, Newton. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so so I think um, the first game is uh, my favorite for starting for the event because it was against Moonstompy. And it lasted about uh, 35 minutes. <laughs> and when uh, we were ending the first game, I, um, I just had nine minutes on my own clock. So I needed to play a bit faster uh, in the next games. Uh -huh. If uh, there was a game three, I needed to scoop very early. But um, the, spe the, speci the speciality of this uh, game is there were so many lock pieces involved, mm -hmm. uh, even from the, be from the beginning. So I think my opponent didn't uh, really make the best play um, when they played Fury, mm -hmm. but um, there were many lock uh, pieces involved and um, I had the possibilities to stall the boards then with Elvish Reclaimer yes. and uh, found a way to break the, the lock. So. 
Yeah, that was definitely one of my favorite uh, matches to watch too. So definitely we'll go over that first, but then uh, especially since that was your favorite match. Uh, so also Moonstopy, in my opinion, has been a harder match ever since the printing of Fury. So I'm glad you were able to pull it out. Um, one thing I will uh, well before I don't want to get spoil it for our audience, but uh, I did post the results of each of the matches. So your did win 2-0. Uh, but yeah, the first game was very long, and, but I do want to ask a few questions before we get started, um, if that's okay with you, Yor. Oh, of course. Okay, so um, these are, I mean, you, you can briefly go through them because I think they're pretty straightforward. Um, so here are the few questions I think the audience would be most curious about. Um, what made you want to learn Elves? Oh, so... Mm, it was always a nice uh, archetype and um, I, one of my first commander decks I built was Nard of the Gilden World from Lorwyn. It's a 4-4 four, four creature for one green mana, black mana and three colorless. And um, in your upkeep, um, I think it's in your upkeep, a player discards a card at random and then you get a 1-1 one, one token of it. So it was a bit related to Commander, uh, I would say. And um, Julian Knapp was already one of the most uh, known Earth players. And um, he also already did his own uh, channel and his own videos at that time. But then it was the time where we met um, um, very often on Magic Online. So it was when I was uh, woke up. Then I uh, started my computer and uh, having my breakfast, and then I started playing games uh, mostly with fast decks like Reanimator and uh, Duck Depths. But we played a couple of times in the morning. So, um, yeah, you're very, very nice opponent, and your deck was very impressive. So, and one um, average reclaimer is one of my favorite creatures since I was playing Duck Depths decks because much too powerful you can get the jury step for example very reliable and if you just enable the card on the board it cannot be countered anymore and also it's a removal magnet so then i just realized okay if i'm playing else um, i would definitely start with the reclaimer version because i'm already used to play with reclaimers and all um, and also it was a transition from depths to the um to to that um sorry to L to else so it was cool that uh many games started with fetchland and reclaimer and the opponent didn't already knew that i was playing on else <laughs> so they assumed i start um i start with the reclaimer as i always do with depths um that was cool at the beginning so this uh, enabled a couple of good starts and free wins i would say but um, the consideration against the deck was always the price of GS Cradle for me. So um, it was always very expensive and it was a bit um, a specific pool, I would say. So if you are going to get the cards for elves in paper at least, so you get very specific cards where you don't have any other uses in other decks or in other archetypes. So especially with GS Cradle. But then I decided, okay, uh, Oko is much too powerful against Depths. And then uh, I went to Else and I started playing it. And at the beginning was very difficult, but uh, then we uh, wrote regularly with each other and then I started playing better. <laughs> that sounds good. So what were the hardest and easiest parts about learning the deck for you? Um, and you, you can just you know, touch quickly on, uh, you know, one thing of each, maybe. Okay. Yeah, the hardest part, I would say, is um, when to use Wildwood Symbiote to get a Visionary back to the hand to draw maybe more cards or just extend the board further. So if you get the next turn, then you have more creatures in play and um, maybe some of your creatures get uh, removed by any removal spell or so but you need to have the critical mass of attackers sometimes 
for Cradle of Behemoth. If you just have two attackers, because all your other creatures were bounced or removed or have summoning sickness, then you're having not lethal and then you're extending the game for another or another two turns. This was, um, and this still, it's very tricky to um, think about when it's right to use the Valwood Symbiote to bounce the Avish Visionary or just keep it in play and have more creatures in play. That, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I know a lot of newer players still struggle with that um, because the automatic thing to do is uh, to bounce it on the opposing end step. Um, what was the easiest part, I guess, for you to, um, about learning the deck? Or maybe, because, I'm assuming maybe uh, because you had played a Reclaimer deck before, maybe that was the easiest part? Yeah, exactly. So that was the same I was thinking. Uh, so using Reclaimer is a bit different in us than in, it is in, in Depths, but uh, in Depths you are just trying to focus on getting your combo cards most of the time, or sometimes reactive cards, depending on the matchup. <coughs> but in Elves you kind of doing the same against some matchups, like um, maybe Reanimator is a good example for me. So. Uh, you have the option to keep a Reclaimer up, and if they're doing something uh, very difficult or very hard, then you just take the Builka Bok and exile the Graveyard. If they're not doing anything, which most reanimators re don't do, so they are giving you so much time, and then you just um, cycle your lands and get, for example, Dryad Arbor or Geos Cradle. And with every other creature from your hand, you already have the mana up for Elvish Reclaimer. And you are able to extend the board. Um, that makes a lot. But of sense. using, but using reclaimer is also a science for itself. I would say so. It's not um, always that easy to find the right uh, land you get out of the deck because all, uh, most of the times it's better to get additional fetch lands out of the deck. Mm -hmm. So you just, um, especially this is uh, the case. Uh, Against matchups where which are play, or which are attacking your mana base, mm -hmm. then it's um, most of the times I would assume it's better to get more fetchlands out of the deck mm -hmm. because if you're um, sacrificing all your forests and all your bayous, you don't have that much mana sources anymore. <laughs> no, that that uh, yep, I I completely know what you're referring to, and then um... but the but the most but the most easiest part of the deck is just. Calculating the damage you have on the board <laughs> after you served with Creative of Behemoth. So right, right. It's the most fun. Sometimes time. I do it. Yeah, exactly. But sometimes I do it twice or even three times in really hard situations mm -hmm. to just not make a fault because I already did some mistakes by calculating with, uh, when I was too too fast with it. But mm -hmm. it's the easiest part and. Sometimes you just need to be aware of uh, removal spells. This is especially true against Dozen Texas now, so they have access to Solitude, right. for example. Even if they are tapped out, you are maybe run into a trap, and then if your math is wrong, then <laughs> especially if they have a JIT in play or so, so uh, or even Flicker Wisp, and then they could uh, re-flicker some targets, for example, and then the matches uh, going in the wrong way so right no definitely death and taxes that matchup is uh while still favorable much uh no longer uh the buy or pseudo buy that it used to be where you can just be cooking a meal when i come back and and realize oh you just or <laughs> click buttons at random and still win no not anymore <laughs> this is not anymore. very hard to play against um, at the moment at least so as I think, I think you're in a unique situation, uh, you, you're, since you picked up the deck, uh, you know, about roughly a year and a half ago. I know a lot of people have a hard time picking up this version of the deck, especially if they've played like the traditional build in the past. Um, what suggestion would you offer for anybody looking to pick up the deck that maybe is, is struggling with, uh, with the learning curve? So it's an easy answer. So the first step is just enter Newton's Discord channel. <laughs> <laughs> you get the most information in this channel and there are so many friendly players. So not only Newton, but uh, you can ask any questions and you get your answers very fast. 
Second step is, I would say, um, watching the, the last or the format dependent videos you have on your YouTube page and also on Runcore's page. They are very much uh, good information with the videos, but um, there are also older videos. You can also watch the older videos. But I would say the current metagame with um, Modern Horizons 2, so it gives you the most um, information at the moment. And then maybe we see a ban in some weeks or in some months, then the format will be different. But um, you, all, you also explain some of the um, some of the lines you take and some of the decisions you do. So very good to learn from. Uh, just before playing the deck, just watch two or three of the last leaks, I would say, and then you get a feeling for it. Mm. Th thank you for the plug. Uh, I wasn't expecting that answer, but uh, I'm, I'm glad you gave that answer that uh, that, that watching the videos has uh, helped. I, I had heard from uh, Inigo Runcor, who's online right now, that that's watching uh, me stream with Romario is what has helped him you know, take the next step in the deck recently as well. Um, and then finally, uh, this is more of a fun question. Uh, what do you enjoy most and least about the deck? Okay, I start with the what I enjoy at least uh, the least with the deck, drawing book uh, progenitors. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that is something that comes up a lot. There's a cool case though. Uh, I don't know if you already watched uh, Inigo's League, uh, which we play, played together. So there was a game against the uh, Buck Control deck. Mm -hmm. And our first draw, I think it was our first draw, exactly, it was the first draw, so we had a good seven hands, mm -hmm. and we were on the draw, and we drew Progenitus right away, so I was debating about, okay, uh, do we want to do a play, or do we just want to get Progenitus <laughs> back into the deck, because it was also so powerful in the matchup, right, right, right. and this would be the best situation to get it back in the deck, and also when they are uh, playing a slow deck, mm -hmm. I would say the drawback isn't that high uh, than against, uh, for example, like a, a combo deck or against a tempo deck. Mm -hmm. But uh, having progenitors in the deck is better than in the hand, I would say. Yeah, I definitely uh, can relate to that. I haven't personally done, made that line, but um, that, that is something interesting to consider for sure. What about your uh, favorite part of the, the deck before we get started? Casting natural order and getting Crater Hoof out of the deck <laughs> with diesel bot state, I would say. Okay, that's a that's a good answer, and I think that's an answer that feels good for a lot of people. I think what I'll go ahead and do now is we'll start with the Moon Stompy matchup, and then, especially since that was your favorite matchup, maybe we'll, we'll take this. Um, and especially since the game one was long, we'll um, spend a little bit longer time on it, and then uh, based on you know audience uh, reaction. I already posted on my tweet uh, what the matchups were, but I can repeat them again if need be, if anybody was curious, uh, for what people want to spend uh, a little bit more time on, and uh, maybe other match because we want to get to the top eight at some point and then spend more probably more detail on that. Um, I haven't watched, like I said, full disclosure, the top eight yet. I have watched all nine rounds except the um, round two, game three, because. Uh, uh, it was missing from the playlist earlier, but that was just the Elf Mirror, which I don't particularly think is too interesting anyways. So maybe that would be a candidate to skip, but you know, we can play by ear uh, based on the audience. So with that said, let's, uh, you know, I'll go ahead and click on the first round and then, uh, oops, and then we'll get started. So one thing I want to, actually, I'll let this run. One thing I wanted, I pointed out to you, York, when you, um, what's it called? Send me the video was uh, and this is probably sh partially my fault too but I definitely would have mulligan that hand but I also told York a long time ago in general it's not uh, good to mulligan with elves so I can see definitely why he kept it and I think in the past this is a hand I definitely keep as well although now only lately I would just probably... mm -hmm. sorry Newton. Um... So if you can stop for a moment, uh, sure. um, then I can at least explain why I kept that hand. Mm -hmm. So the first reason was that I didn't already knew what I was playing against. So 
usually in the um, legacy challenges and in PDQs and in high stake tournaments, I just go to MTG Goldfish and see what the people are usually playing. So, but with this user account, I didn't have a hit, so I was totally in the dark. And so this hand had, um, the starting hand had once upon a time, so there was a chance that I'm still missing the mana source or initial mana source. But the two GS Cradle um, should be very helpful, especially in combination with the Glimpse of Nature. Mm -hmm. But if I knew that I uh, played against a specific matchup, then I can have a better decision to keep or uh, mulligan this hand. Mm -hmm. And having Arc of Raiders Reach in your hand, in your starting hand, is always not that great, I would say. Especially since we are not playing a Savannah at the moment. Mm -hmm. But the rest of the cards were, seemed to be strong to me, so... Yeah, it's, it's only reasonable tent. enough, and then... On a six, I probably keep it, although I don't love it. Um, only because the glimpse of nature probably isn't live for uh, at least a few turns. Yeah, and we are. Yeah, you're right. But we are starting to play in glimpse usually in turn three anyway, right. so we have a bit of time usually. Mm -hmm. So we'll continue with this match. Um, I think. Trinisphere is a card that we never want to see on the other side, but uh, I was quite impressed of, you know, how you navigated through uh, this matchup because I definitely had pro uh, problems recently with this matchup because of Fury, but in my opinion, like you hinted at, the opponent um, was a little bit too aggressive in my opinion with playing the Fury just to kill a water with Symbiote. Um, one difference there also um, that I, I, you know, sent you my notes is I probably would have played the Green Sun Zenith for two, uh, but I probably would have got the Collector Oof only because it shuts down their uh, their mana. But I think getting a, uh, what did you get? A Birch Lore was reasonable. Yeah, and Virtual Ranger was the target because of the Archon of Raiders Reach in hand. Mm -hmm. So there could be a way to have Archon in play mm -hmm. next or the second next turn. Mm -hmm. And here we have the situation, so there are uh, Trinity Spheres and a Blood Moon, but the Blood Moon still helped me in this situation because Gia's Cradle doesn't do any mana <laughs> yeah, at that's this actually... stage of the game. <laughs> and that was good to, to have Reclaimer in play, mm -hmm. also as a 3-4 creature. Right, they, 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 they really can't really um, kill at, at this point. And most of us don't even run Chandra at the moment, too. Uh, you mean the Formana Chandra? The yeah, for, of mo I think most lists are running the, um, I forgot what it's called, the, the creature that uh, has haste is like a 4 3, I think, and then like uh, exiles an attacking creature and then puts another creature into play. From the, I forgot what it's called, but Fire Flux Squad, I think. Yeah, okay. Oh. Yeah, there are very different lists. Uh, there are more aggress aggressive lists, there are more. Uh, controlish lists with Khan, for example. Mm -hmm. And the reason to get the second Reclaimer here was to have a, a big board with uh, re resilient creatures. Mm -hmm. And the plan was already to get the tokens out, from, out of the board, mm -hmm. uh, take the hit from the um, from Rebel the Goblin, Master. from the Rebel Master, and then the next turn he couldn't attack with the Rebel Master again. That makes sense. I don't. I didn't want it to trade with the reclaimer at this stage because uh, it's too valuable. Right. On the, the other hand, with the good. ensnaring bridge, pardon. I, I was just saying, uh, it's a tomagoyf at this point, right? Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, with the ensnaring bridge in play, it could be hard to get it to attacking mode. But um, I think it's at this stage of the game. I was at eleven life, and I could take one hit with the rebel master to go into seven. Yeah, so also a uh, quick thing I, I should have done earlier. If you haven't subscribed to your uh, YouTube page, please do so, um, you know, after the stream or d during stream if you want to watch it, uh, you know, in real time yourself. Um, uh, I'm sure Jorg um, will post more videos in the future and that might be a useful tool for anybody trying to learn the deck. Uh, what I wanted to say uh, also was um, 
the opponent probably didn't realize how to use to play Chalice of the Void on one. Yeah. They were trying for several uh, clicks and already uh, read it that and mm -hmm. then they played it for two uh, I would say and that was a situation where you see here they have different cards they are getting but they are get countered from their own chalice right. so the liquid metal coating wouldn't be read relevant at this moment but later there uh, was also a moment where they get another two mana card and it's uh, very tricky to do the Chalice under a Trinisphere, but if they are playing that deck and they aren't able to use it, yeah, that's their own fault. My suspect, I suspect that they are probably new to the deck because I played it in one league with Nathan Lippitz a, a long time ago when he was on uh, my stream, and I had problems doing exactly what you're describing right now, which is trying to play a Chalice when Trinisphere is out. So I, I know, I think a lot of people are aware of this. Uh, I wouldn't say it's an issue, but more so this complexity uh, that is associated with, 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 with which is more of a dex, dexterity uh, thing, right? Yeah. Uh, another thing that I didn't do uh, did before was getting virtual rangers out of nature order. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think uh, that's probably the first time I've seen that. I've done some natural orders for you know one drops and two drops, but. Uh, definitely cool to see the virtual ranger coming off a natural order, um, which is really yeah. Cool. And then I, then I used Grist and uh, the uh, Behemoth was in the graveyard, mm -hmm. but with the engineering bridge in play, Behemoth wouldn't be yeah exactly. And here in the situation, they played uh, Sorcerer's Spyglass, uh -huh. and it was countered by their own Chalice. Mm -hmm. um, I would think that uh, game gaming decision fault because. If they were naming either Chris or probably better even the Shepherd, uh -huh. there shouldn't be a way to to lose that game, I mm -hmm. would say. And then here is the situation where this is the last turn to use and cast uh, Archon of Vader's Reach mm -hmm. because they are having uh, Khan up and they could get Mikus and Lethis. Uh, Lethis. So bent everything good for me in this game, I would say. Mm -hmm. And. As you said, the uh, opponent did some mistakes, I would say. So usually it should be harder or possible to win that game. Yeah, something I've, I've realized is if you are going to make um, you know bigger mistakes, so to speak, uh, probably best to make them early for two reasons. One, if you lose, you can probably drop or whatnot if you're, if you get, after you get your second loss. If you, and, but if you win, it's almost a relief, right? Because... Uh, usually the earlier round opponents are not as um, experienced as your later round opponents. So it's kind of a win-win a, a scenario. If, if you're going to make a mistake, usually you want to make it them pretty early on. Exactly. Um, I don't know of if the opponent was playing from Europe or Asia or mm -hmm. US. So, But it was about... Um, 12, 12.30 a.m. at this moment uh, when I was playing the game. Maybe he was from, from USA and was very... Could be very tired, right? Because uh, very I didn't... Very tired, exactly. Uh, I only played the first event and then I didn't play... Like the middle event was never an option for me because it was in the middle of the night. And I live in, the, in California. So yeah, um, it used to be much more difficult to beat a ensnaring bridge, but Shepard makes it easier now. Before you would have to wait longer with, after your Archon, you know, strands the cards in hand, and then you attack them with one ones. But now the kill is a lot easier. I guess we can go ahead and watch the second um, match against uh, Moon Stompy. I. I think this is, yeah, this was the hand where they went all in and on a six drop Chandra, and you, we happen to have the Gris, which is kind of funny if you think about it. Yeah, exactly. And the Planeswalkers are the reason um, I saw that you, in, uh, so at least in the sideboard guide, uh, I saw that you are not preferring Gris in the matchup. Mm -hmm. 
but the planeswalkers are a good reason for us to keep uh, it in, 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 in the deck because um, sometimes they get really heavy starts with the planeswalkers oh. and I think it's an out for at least and it also is an alternative win condition against Incineron Bridge so mm -hmm. I think at least against Moonstompy we should keep it in uh, sometimes it's hard to cast it because of the black mana but Still, it's an alternative win condition against the bridge. So, so something you did well that I hope players keep in mind is the cyborg guide is only a reference, um, and the current cyborg guide that I have posted on my Discord is actually with re reference to the um, Fire Flux Squad version. Against the Planeswalker version, uh, York had was smart enough to, or and experienced enough to know to keep in Gris where. You know, you don't want to follow my guide, you know, blindly without knowing the theory behind it. And uh, very heads up by your for realizing that uh, Gris is much better here against the Planeswalker version. Yeah, and also the legacy decks are um, changing about every one or every two weeks, so. Um, there are also new trends, especially for, for any weekend, so I would agree that it's good to have an idea of the how how do the current look uh, lists look like, and then you can react a bit and make your own changes based on what uh, which cards you see, for example. Mm -hmm. And if they are more in like an aggro version, then I also think that the card isn't that worth it, because they wouldn't play in Snaring Bridge then, mm -hmm. and they wouldn't play that many Planeswalkers then, but... Mm -hmm. Yeah, so here I don't think there's much, um, what's it called, it's too interesting from this point, uh, I mean there's only like a minute or so I think left in this match, uh, you're just comboing off now and our opponent is Hellbent, uh, and like, like you already mentioned, um, or like we mentioned earlier, being an ensnaring bridge uh, a lot quicker now with uh, Allosaurus Shepherd because uh, you don't actually have to have like 18 creatures on board uh, as one wants to do so anymore, or two twos, or, or well, I guess there's no two twos in this version, but um, I'll stop it right here. Uh, your, um, I personally don't think the elf matchup is too interesting. Um, if the audience wants, we can go through this. Um, are there any specific matchups you want to go through um, in particular? I think the lands one is kind of interesting, even though you want 2-0, uh, only because I think it's one of the harder matchups right now. Um, any? Yeah, I agree. So the lands, um, the lands matchup was also very interesting for me because I used to have problems to play against Tabernacle. Mm -hmm. And uh, in my opinion, I found a way to play against the Tabernacle. So. I don't know if everything went perfect, but I uh, usually have problems with Tabernacle, but uh -huh. used to manage to play against it in this game, so mm -hmm. um, maybe it's a good way to improve to get better against the Tabernacle and yeah, discuss that's... about if the strategy was right or sometimes it's also right to sacrifice creatures. So, so the reason why I say Elves matchup is not too interesting, and Lands I think is very interesting, although some of your games didn't play out in um, the traditional sense, but the reason why I say Elves matchup is not too interesting is because typically what happens is, uh, regardless if you're playing the Netto version or the, the our, or our version, is whoever goes first likely wins. And the reason being is because uh, it's hard to stop turn three natural order. Um, and the cards that typically matter are only natural order and discard because discard can stop the natural order. Um, it can get grindy where wirewood and visionary uh, matter, but in terms of play patterns, I don't think it's particularly too interesting. And a lot of it is already decided by who's going first and and how you uh, your opening hand, right? Like you have to mulligan a five or whatnot um, because you can't keep a slower hand, uh, in my opinion, in the mirror. Unless you have yeah, but Newton. Right? Yeah, in the sideboard games it looks uh, different. But Newton, um, I would say in game one, I think it's a good, um, it's a good way to show how good the card Christ is for our deck. So, 
Yes, um, I did see game that. Game 1 was decided <laughs> by Grist. Um, I think we have different opinions about how uh, the value is in the mirror, but I would say it's very good to have access to the card, and this game sh um, shows it. So yes, if you so, want to so, just start the Game 1, I would say, and the sideboard games... Uh, oh, I happen to click much... exactly to it, but... Uh... Long story short, we were uh, our opponent was able to answer the Archon with a Gris, um, which is what uh, Jörg is referencing. But in general, I don't think this matchup is too inter interesting uh, on the whole. But what Jörg is saying is, um, yeah, the Gris can be the difference and a way to break, uh, so to speak, break up the Archon uh, lock. Uh, yeah, either the Archon Lock or um, Emra Cool or Grizzle Brand. <laughs> so yes. any any problematic creature <laughs> you can usually handle with Grist. Right. So I'll go ahead and start with uh, you know our lands matchup because I think this is a little more interesting. But we see the action with Grist and Archon later. I promise. <laughs> So I would say uh, a key uh, step in this game was that the opponent didn't have that much, much mana denial. Mm -hmm. Or at least later they didn't have that much mana denial. The wasteland is big there, by the way. Yeah. So, so they, so, they use all their resources. Mm -hmm. So they use all their resources to... Um, Handle my mana, mm -hmm. but in this board state, um, why I would submit is at least an option to have um, enough mana sources, especially with the Triad Arbor in play. Mm -hmm. And what I used, uh, what I did in this situ situation, as you saw, that I used the mana with Bachelor Ranger and then bounce the creatures to have the mana back again. Yeah, this is a trick that I actually learned from Julian Nav as well when I was, um, you know, just learning the deck and then uh, watching one of his videos because uh, it's much easier, as um, you hinted at, to learn a deck when you can see somebody who's, you know, more experienced or already playing it and then um, using the Waterwood to bounce uh, Elves so that you can untap Arbor um, and then not pay for some of the Tabernacle triggers is very important in this matchup. So uh, shout out to Julian if he's watching right now or uh, or if anybody wants to relay it to him that uh, this specific thing I learned from him just by watching videos, you know, back when I was starting to pick up the deck. Uh, one thing I want to point out here, oops, uh, did I miss it already? Oh, hey, I already missed it, but I'll let it go. Um, one trick I do in this matchup, York, that I don't know how often you use is with the trigger on the stack i'll actually pitch the arbor to reclaimer for the cradle there because um that saves us from having to pay one extra oh uh, yeah uh, i think i didn't uh used to do that that often but thanks for the trick yeah that, that it's not intuitive Oh, yeah. I appreciate that, Julian. Yeah, uh, so th yeah, shout out to you for... Uh, that is something I learned from you just by watching one of your old videos against the Lands matchup. This is like several years ago, obviously, but um, very, very useful trick in this Lands matchup. And then uh, now, yeah, with the trigger on the stack, something I learned, you know, not too long ago, I guess, is it's quite helpful to Green Sun uh, turn one for Arbor and then pitch it for a Cradle later on with the Tabernacle trigger on the stack. So here's the Archon, um, you know, naming instant coming down. And there's the Blast Zone. But the opponent, um, it's a strange action, I would say. They could just use the Blast Zone and uh, Blast Zone, <coughs> but they decided to play it another Wallachut exploration. Mm -hmm. Probably they felt very safe as they had the Glacial Chasm. Mm -hmm. So they usually have uh, at least one round or maybe two rounds, uh, two turns, sorry, mm -hmm. of time before they have to use the blast zone. Mm -hmm. 
But as I saw the blast zone, I could already prepare for it mm -hmm. and take uh, more else to my hand. Right, right. That makes sense. Yeah, blast zone is typically hard, I think, to play around um, out, of, out of lands because we kind of, our wins typically revolve around a fast natural order. And a lot of times I feel we have to just play into it. And if they have it, we just live with it because... It's hard to win a long game with, against lands uh, in general. Not impossible, but um, usually a lot has to go right. We would prefer not to, to get into the long game. So here in this situation, uh, I knew that they had the life from the loam in the graveyard. Mm -hmm. And I need to have mana up so I can use the Reclaimer to exile the graveyard with. As they, as they cast the life from the loam, um, <coughs> I get the Bujuka Bog and then exile it. Yeah, so the, the Bog main deck, um, for those of you who uh, you know, haven't seen this version much or haven't played it, it's just almost always relevant. Um, and when it's not... It's usually the matchup is not determined because it's uh, a tap land or, or a dead yeah. card. Like yeah. Something like Moonstone, like this... that's not going to matter. Okay. But in this situation, uh, when I used to get uh, the Bujuka box, then the opponent <coughs> could use their Wasteland they found of the Valakut Exploration. Mm -hmm. But it didn't really matter because I had enough mana to keep enough attackers in play. Right. Even not uh, keeping all of the creatures. So they have two zombies and the maze of his, so I just need to do one damage anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that was uh, very nice to see. I think I think I mentioned a few times on my recent streams, like the questions that's asked is, what's uh, what's the hard matchup for elves? And I would say lands is the hardest matchup right now. And Yorg, uh, you know, spoiler alert, won in two games, so very impressive. Yeah, what, what this has game... Is, uh, go ahead, George. I know, what, uh, what you, did you want to say? Oh, I was just going to say, what has helped is the um, Force of Vigors being added to the sideboard to specifically uh, address this matchup. Yeah, and also, um, I like to have the mix of uh, Force of Vigor and Wasteland and Crop Rotation. Mm -hmm. So, mm, both of the cards are very strong in the matchup, that's clear. Mm -hmm. But um, you can lose to the to the other part if you're focusing too much on Force of Vigor, for example. They ju just can have the turn two Rarid Age, mm -hmm. probably. So there are situations where you couldn't do that much against it, but uh, having access to get uh, the Wasteland out of the crop rotation mm -hmm. really helps in the matchup. And here we have the situation uh, if you can uh, get about 10 seconds back, please. Sure. So here we have the situation um, where they are considering or they are deciding to use the life from the loam and get the Wither Saga back. But if they didn't didn't uh, play the life from the loam, they could already have... The Merit Lage, right? Um, the Merit Lage, exactly. So... Um, I don't know why they decided uh, decided to do uh, to, to do, uh, don't do that. I, but... I noticed this too, York, and I think our opponent just got a little bit greedy and didn't expect the main deck, um, or I guess not main deck, but didn't expect the endurance to hit the um, yep. target in the yard. Which um, I do think, yeah, our opponent was a little bit greedy here. Exactly. And uh, this is it's a cool scenario because. Uh, um, we are trying to, res or we are responding to the life from the loam, so we are denying the lands getting back. This is all also very important if they are have Wasteland or Tabernacle, for example, in the graveyard or Glacial Chasm. Mm -hmm. So you're denying taking back the lands, and in addition to that, we get another attacker and another mana by using the Geos Cradle. All so right. we're having lethal in the next turn. Something I want to point out is. Um... We won without, um, you know, having to... We were able to tap four mana for the natural order. I mentioned this before uh, a long time ago. I don't think I mentioned it on stream. 
this is one of the few matchups where it's almost impossible to win without Gaius Cradle because the Tabernacle is the way you beat elves um, is to attack their mana and it this card locks up our best card in the matchup so we have to generate mana outside and I I don't think I ever say this uh, in any other matchups but Heritage Druid tends to be the best creature in this matchup um, and I think your uh, if you want to comment a little bit on that or if you think that's accurate it's like between heritage druid and reclaimer because reclaimer gets cradle obviously but a lot of times like your cradle will be locked up by either a richard and port or or tabernacle like i said yeah and i would also say that quirun ranger is a big miss in the matchup Agreed. because especially um when you are low on lands you can at least um also in addition to um try it out on tap steps you can also save your lands, especially the bayous from mana denial, uh -huh. and um, it enables to have access to more mana to uh, play more elves, especially with the heritage druid. Then you uh -huh. are able to pay the tax for the tabernacle a bit easier. Mm -hmm. So this is a big miss in the current list. Right. So no, I, I agree with this that. Is one, this is one of the matchups I would uh, consider to play maybe one of Quirin Ranger to get it out of the deck as a tutor target. Mm -hmm. But I think it's very clear we have so many Silver Wolves in this deck at the moment, so we don't have any space to play the Quirin Ranger. Um, and with Elisaurus Shepard, it takes four slots uh, right. because it's uh, one of the best elves in the format or in the whole game of Magic. So mm -hmm. um, it's not... Uh, very easy to play the Quirin Ranger. Mm -hmm. But uh, Inijo also, also um, asked for a question in the chat. It's okay for you. Uh, yeah, um, let me bring it up. Try to answer for here. it. So, yeah, Inigo, um, do you want to address that uh, question uh, yourself, York? The, about the tabernacle? Mm, yeah, so um, what I thought about um, beating tabernacle could be a possibility to have a slower start uh, if you are not having too much creatures in play that early then you are not uh, not uh, forced to spend the mana uh, to pay for your creatures and also um, your lands are very safe to uh, the wastelands for example and uh, one of the main priority from my perspective is to not die to Merit Lage, so it's uh, very clear that if you are giving them too much time, then they are able to do Merit Lage and then the game is over. And another way to lose the game is the graveyard interactions with Life from the Loam. Um, so you should uh, prioritize to not die to Merit Lage and to keep the graveyard in check. And then uh, try to get an possibility to uh, natural order for progenitors then you have you need only two attacks with that yeah so I, mean, I think it's a consideration it. as a game plan but i didn't test it that much and the games went a bit different here but that was a bit of a strategy i would i thought about to beat tabernacle just not have too many creatures in in, in play so if you have four creatures in play, you all, uh, always spend your mana to keep them in play. You not uh, need to keep all creatures in play. But on the other hand, if you always use your elves and your heritage druids and tap your elves to pay for them, then you can't uh, can't attack them, and then you can't kill them even if you have access to credible, for example. Right. <clears throat> I will say um, before we move on to the next matchup. Uh, I think some people are surprised or a little caught off by um, the Singleton Wasteland in the sideboard. It is specifically for this matchup. Um, like I said, this is the hardest, one of the hardest matchups for us, if not the hardest. Uh, thank you, uh, Bones, for the um, for the raid and then for the, uh, the encouraging words. Uh, no worries. Um, you know, good luck at Eternal Weekend Vintage. Uh, I don't think. I'm not playing, and I don't know if Yorg is playing or not, but, um, yeah, for those of you who are playing, uh, what is it called, Eternal uh, Weekend Vintage, uh, you know, good luck, I guess. But, 
the crop rotation and the wasteland are specifically for the crop rotation decks, which are lands and green-white depths. Our next matchup is against um, Rug Cascade, which is not too popular. Uh, I'm not sure how useful... The matchup is like fairly straightforward too, in my opinion. It's just a race. Um, York, what do you think? Should we skip that matchup or do you want to go over that? Or um, I think the Depths one is like potentially interesting or the 8-cast one, even though uh, I joke 8-cast is like one of the best things from a metagame perspective to happen to Elves. Um, yeah, so I think we can skip the Rock Cascade uh, match. Uh, what I want to mention in the match is um, there was a situation where they had three mana up Mm -hmm. And um, I had uh, the possibility to resolve Natural Order, mm -hmm. and and then I got the Archon mm -hmm. and named Instant because I assumed they are having a Violent Outburst, access to Violent Outburst or oh. Brazen uh -huh. If they bounce the creature, they uh, just bounce the Archon. Mm -hmm. So if you name Sorcery, you uh, keep your own Sorceries in check with it and you deny the... Uh, Reno Tramplers, uh -huh. but I don't think the Reno tra Tramplers are a problem if you are having Archon in play, so just name Instant. And then, um, uh, because they didn't respond to the... Um, probably they couldn't have access to Violent Outburst, but they uh -huh. didn't respond to the Archon mm -hmm. or to the Natural Order, mm -hmm. so maybe it was also like a time walk for me, because right. they didn't uh, did what they could did. Uh -huh. um, uh, what they could do, sorry. So, but I didn't know they had. And in game two, uh, they had a turn one Blood Moon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've definitely been got by that uh, that deck, but with Blood Moon before, uh, especially when they're on the draw. I'm oh, sorry, when they're on the play, where they can just do a turn one. And I'm just looking at all my fetches in my uh, hand, and uh, the game is practically over at that point. Like, you have to get kind of lucky to draw your natural uh, basic exactly. force, which. We only have two, and um, that is a concession right now to uh, just trying to make Reclaimer a 3-4 as consistently as possible and having the most um, robust mana base, even if that means we're a little bit susceptible to turn one blood. Um, yeah, exactly. And having access to Bayou if you're playing against the combo deck is also very important, so you play just nine, nine patch lands. And so that's actually why always... you're... Yes, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. That's actually why Jorg and I, um, we were on the white splash for a while because Source of Plowshares is an amazing card. But we noticed that our combo matchup was starting to suffer because we couldn't get black for uh, Thoughtseize consistently. And that's why we went back to the drawing board and started playing Fatal Push because while not as good as Source of Plowshares, it's much better for our mana base. And I felt like anybody who knows me knows there's nothing more important from a deck building perspective to me than a stable mana base. And I was willing to give up the powerful white cards, uh, you know, to essentially shore up our mana base. And the rediscovery of Assassin's Trophy as a good metagame card right now is what I think is what positions elves uh, well right now in the metagame. Uh, so, Jorg, with that said, would you want to go over the Depths matchup more or the Acast matchup? I don't know. Let the chat decide. Oh, that's a good, that's a great way to that's a great way to um to you know to ha to settle that uh to decide. I guess yeah, that's a great suggestion. So chat. I don't know. Uh, could you start a poll? Or uh, I used to uh, do a poll. I don't know if uh, it's possible for you. I saw ANZD sometimes do a poll, so people can decide. But uh, I don't it's know. probably possible, <laughs> but I ha have no idea what I'm doing as a streamer, so. Uh, I don't know how to actually do it. I'm sure some one of my, uh, what is it called? <coughs> one of my admins can probably figure that out. Okay, I get a, a fresh can of water in the meanwhile and be back in about two minutes. Sure, sure. We can take a quick break and then if there's any um, responses from chat, uh, we'll go ahead and go with that. Uh, in the meantime, since you're getting water, I'll, I'll take a quick break uh, as well to, you know, refill my cup of water as well in, in uh, what's it called, and uh, use the restroom.
Newton, are you there? So, Jord, are you um, back by any chance? Yeah, I'm back. Okay, sounds good. Um, so, there has been no response from the Twitch chat. Um, do you have any preference towards... Uh, I think what, what we can do is maybe go over the uh, green-white depths matchup. Um, yeah, I would also no... say that it's more interesting. Uh, I, I also it was, a bit, I also... it was a bit more close, I would say, so... Mm -hmm. The uh, eight cast matchup or the eight eight cast match was very clear win, I would say. Right, and I, um, it was I much closer to play against Debs. Yeah, I think what we'll do is we'll go with the green white Debs matchup. Probably skip the eight cast matchup. I, I do want to say one thing about the eight cast. Uh, that uh, game two, our opponent had a uh, gear poor uh, aether grid, and we were able to assassin's trophy it. So that's of note. But in general, I think that is probably our best matchup at the moment. So, I think, excuse me, I think it doesn't really do, um, you know, uh, our viewers any uh, service right now to go over it because I think you could probably pick up our deck uh, without any uh, prior experience and probably still beat the 8-cast deck because, like I said, I think that it's our best matchup and the I posted out yesterday uh, the five metagame decks that I'm thankful for. And I listed it number one because not only is it a, a favorable matchup, but it tends to be good against all the stuff that we don't really want to see against either. So, um, you know, it is Thanksgiving, and I would like to thank uh, ACAST for being a, a part of the metagame now. Uh, so with that said, um, York, did you want to add anything, or I'm just going to go straight into the uh, the matchup? No, we can go, just start the match okay. against Depths. I think I have notes for this matchup where there's a few situations where uh, I would have done something different than you, but I totally understand why you went for the line that you went. So on this stage, um, I thought it could be a mirror match mm -hmm. first, but then the uh, lesbian stage appeared. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, it wasn't it wasn't that good to cast a uh, uh, glimpse of nature there, but um, I knew that I don't have that much time against depths, so, so yeah, it's just I, the cycling. Yeah, so this is actually the, the 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 turn that I think I would have played it a little bit differently. Um, uh, I I I know you're setting up for a turn. Uh, I guess it would be turn four, right? Uh, natural order. Uh, I personally would have just played out the cradle. And then draw on at least another two cards uh, with it. The reason being is because um, if they have removal, the natural order suddenly gets a lot worse. And we're going to have at least, ideally, two draws, potentially three off the visionary. And I think that's worth, uh, you know, cashing in on in case they have removal to play around. But, um, you know, small difference between us uh, philosophically there. Yeah, the idea behind that was um, that I want to save the Gia's Cradle mm -hmm. for the last moment for the Natural Order. Right. Um, so you're playing around if the I knew, For example, exactly. If I knew that I have access to Heritage Druid then in the next turn, mm -hmm. it would be completely different. But <laughs> um, I wanted to play it a bit more safe. But uh, as you mentioned, playing around removal would be uh, also an option. Right, so, so the difference between Jorg and I there, um, chat, is he opted to play around Wasteland, which is totally understandable, and I opted to play around Removal. So as you saw here, uh, winning the die roll was very important, so yes. I was uh, just one turn quicker than the opponent. Mm -hmm. 
So one thing I would have done is uh, I probably would have led with the Allosaurus Shepherd because in case they play removal, um, we care le less about that. Uh, it, it gets prismatic ending. But small, uh, you know, small nitpick. And then um, oh. Progenitus is very good in this matchup. Yeah, yeah. It's also uh, also so oftentimes it's correct to not play the best creature first. So uh, many players just play the first removal spell on your first creature. Right. And you you, you usually don't use Elvish Reclaimer in turn two anyway. So you can just play another random elf before that, mm -hmm. and then the next turn you have uh, the option to play Reclaimer. Right. And then um, another thing I want to mention um, that Jorg did well is he kept a Assassin's Trophy up because from this board state, once we untap with Progenitus, that's probably the only way we lose this game. So that that was... Uh, there's no need to fetch Arbor because it doesn't do anything, right? Like, you, a lot of times you, with this deck, you almost want to think of it as a mid-range or almost control deck because you instead of thinking about how you want to win, you think about how you lose the game. Um, and then this, I think we can skip because, like I said, you can kind of, you know, do anything and still win against ACAS. Um, yeah, and especially if you know that you are playing against the deck. So um, right. it's uh, much easier to just get the option to get access to Collector Oof in turn two. So. Mm -hmm. Do you want to go over the Reanimator re matchup or no? I thought it was pretty straightforward. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, you can if you want. It, it's it's uh, it's very quick. Uh, it's very quick game, and uh, I have got it's hands. I have got hands. In in both, uh, uh, when I can just, uh, I want to explain a bit about before we start the game, if it's okay for you. Sure, I'll stop. Because um, uh, as I mentioned, I'm going to search for the opponent on uh, goldfish uh, at the beginning of the match, and didn't found any uh, hit about the opponent, mm. and then I. Uh, went back to the uh, match uh, overview of the previous rounds and then if you're clicking on the previous rounds you can see uh, how fast the games are, are went uh, or did went so uh, if you're seeing that the opponent is winning after two or three minutes then you are, can assume that either reanimator or uso spells <laughs> And if the game takes about 20 or 25 minutes, you can assume it's like a control deck or a very slow deck at least. And then I saw that uh, the games were very fast, so about three or four minutes. Uh -huh. So I knew, okay, it's probably like reanimator or use all spells. <laughs> and then my starting hand uh, wasn't that great, I would say. And with the mulligan, with the access to endurance, uh -huh. I knew so this hand here is not it's not a keepable hand in the back room I would say. It, but if you're expecting keepable. to play I think it's I very would, keepable. I think it's barely keepable. Like as barely. In, okay. I would keep it but I would not like it. Yeah, but if you're assuming that you're playing guns against a fast combo deck, then endurance is one of the best weapons. Mm -hmm. And the cool thing here is also, that I have uh, ex uh, access to once upon a time to negate the Chancellors and the Endurance. So it's like a God Hand against Reanimator, I would say. No, I, and, I definitely uh, agree. Um, this is and the last aspect is also the access to Green Sun Zenith for Average Reclaimer, mm -hmm. what we are seeing against uh, in the next turn. Yeah, that's then, actually something um, I hadn't uh, thought of, but that's a good point by Jorg. Like, if you. You want if you're unsure what your opponent is playing in a challenge, and this is something I I guess I'm not as experienced in because I don't play as many challenges. Um, I guess one way to figure out the um, deck your opponent on is to, you know, click the, on the time of match, and that's something I wouldn't have thought of, but very uh, heads up by York to uh, to identify that. And here, um, Jorg is, uh, you know, going, because our opponent used the pedal just to uh, faithless looting, he's just going to main phase, the, or not main phase, but preemptively take out the Chancellors and hope that our opponent can't beat, uh, doesn't have a, an additional uh, pitch in, in their hand. One thing I will say is, uh, 
we had a fantastic top deck there of Reclaimer because if we untap with Reclaimer, the game is over barring us naturally drawing the bog. Yeah, and I kept the GS Cradle in hand, not because I feared um, Mana Denial, mm -hmm. so um, I didn't have an advantage uh, at that stage of the game uh -huh. because uh, I was in top deck mode anyway, so I could play it anyway, mm -hmm. but it's also uh, a way to force or Maybe the opponent has even more discard spells, so mm -hmm. sometimes it's good to have um, the cards or the cradle in hand. Mm -hmm. uh, so if they have access to discard spells, then mm -hmm. uh, they are wasting the two life, for example, if it's the Sotsis. Mm -hmm. And here you can just leave him with the Endurance, it mm -hmm. uh, doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. And here, uh, I don't know if it's uh, very correct to sacrifice the Triad Arbor. I could have uh, kept it in play instead, but... Uh, well, you got it back, right, with the Exhume? Exactly, uh, because of the Exhume. But uh, because of that, um, the Triad Arbor was not in the graveyard and the Reclaimer were just one twos at the stage. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't attack for, I think, two turns in this situation. Uh -huh. But um, they didn't have anything, so I, I had uh, all the time I needed. So, so, so one thing here I we see out. the same. One thing I want to point out to chat is uh, that's one of the minor differences, I would say, in between our playstyles. Uh, Jorg is probably a little bit more aggressive than I am. Uh, I think I'm naturally a closeted uh, control player because I probably don't even tap... Uh... Well, actually, that's not true. Uh, yeah, I, I, I was just going to say... Um... There, actually, I take that back. There's no reason to leave the second Reclaimer up because there's only one Bog in the... In the, in the um... In the deck yeah and we already used our endurance right. so uh, endurance is very cool to just target yourself to get your utility lands back into the deck right you can get and the bomb can... back exactly or um after the two dried arbor for example were destroyed you can but i don't only do that uh, if the opponent uh, doesn't have any special things in the graveyard mm -hmm. and if i don't have any reclaimers in play right so if I ha don't have any Reclaimers in play, you can easily target yourself mm -hmm. with the Endurance. Uh -huh. But you don't want to uh, get your Reclaimers small against if you have one or two in play, for example. Uh, I, I want to bring this situation up. This is something that I've noticed <coughs> some players will do um, based on habit. is to fetch the Arbor preemptively uh, prior to tapping the Guy's Cradle. Uh, I actually lately have been sequencing this a little bit differently um the reason why i wouldn't get the arbor there is my line it would be to visionary off uh, a bayou and a forest um and then be prior to casting the glimpse because we we know our opponent is down to one card already and uh this actually gets us more mana um, overall for our guys creator. What I mean by that is we get to cast our visionary but still have two floating uh, post visionary and ideally we can just play the collector oof and then whatever we draw and or we can sandbag what we draw in case we want to save it for the glimpse but none, the point is um, natural order is going to be lethal next turn and which is actually relevant for what's about to happen. Uh, I would also say that in this stage of the tournament, um, this was the, the eighth, eighth round of the tournament, and mm -hmm. uh, it was I was a bit uh, wasted, I would say. So uh, it was was okay. uh, not that easy. It was was not that easy to have uh, every situation uh, that much concentrated. Mm -hmm. But in this stage of the game, I thought, okay, this is my chance to get um, Crater of Beamit. Um, they just used the um, Jace. I didn't want to give Anzi more time in this situation uh -huh. um, because if, the longer I wait, uh, he found more removal spells, for example. Mm -hmm. And there was also a chance because they played, uh, I think, four removal spells before that, three or four removal spells before that. Uh -huh. So there was a chance that I didn't have uh, the sorts of blow chest there, so I decided to go for the Crater Hoof. Mm -hmm. And um, I could also go for Grist, for example, mm -hmm. and then um, 
No, I think and I think the, going for hoof is definitely Jace. the right play Get it for that turn because you take the the Jace out too. If, if even if they have the swords. Exactly. But um, I think yeah, it was the play before the turn before where my old instinct would be to fetch Arbor, but I think it's actually correct because you have more mana to play the Visionary without glimpsing and then play the. Um, if you don't draw anything relevant, you just cycle the glimpse for the uh, for the draw on the uh, collector oof. But then that that would give you an additional creature uh, based on how you sequenced it to attack uh, the following turn. And we, we, as you notice, we we happen to be one one attacker short for lethal, which ended up mattering. It's just a optim man optimization is is the only thing I'm saying. No. So here it's kind of hard to win once we've already uh, used our our hoof because, especially with an Ural out, um, I believe it's very difficult to win through this matchup at this point, and uh, that's typically how it plays out because the Ural would drown us in card advantage or just yeah. One thing that is worth pointing out in the second game is. Um, there's a debate, and I'm not sure which one's better, especially against Anorak's deck, which has no basics, if Trophy is better than Endurance. Because there's an argument to be made Endurance might be better because the only way they can really beat us is with, with, an, is with a Uro. Um, you want to comment a little bit on that, York? Yeah, uh, that's the reason because... Uh, that's the reason why I played uh, two Endurances against him. So uh, I was at the same uh, consideration. So uh, having access to more endurance gives uh, more advantage to us. Uh, also to get the cards from our graveyard back into the deck uh -huh. if it gets uh, more grindy. Uh -huh. And also to have more actions or more outs for their Uro. Mm -hmm. and, but I would say uh, one Bujukabok and one endurance should be enough for, to handle their Uro. Most of the time, but um, having access to the second endurance gives you an extra um, protection, mm -hmm. and on top of that, it's also a flash creature. So, right, right. Um, if you don't want to extend the board much more, if you are playing a bit around terminus, for example, right. then you can cast it uh, in the end step, mm -hmm. or sometimes maybe you can even catch the opponent if he attacks with a containment priest, for example, right. if you have an almost empty board, so um, it gives um, good ways to improve for the long game. Mm -hmm. And if you cut in uh, Virtual Rangers, for example, it's totally okay, mm -hmm. uh, because uh, having access to black mana shouldn't be that hard against the deck, right. even if they have access to Wasteland, but they usually target the GS Cradle anyway. Right. The one thing I will notice, um... Is I personally would hold the Green Sun uh, on the turn before, but like it's because our hand doesn't have any payoff anytime soon. I think getting Arbor is reasonable because you do want to develop your uh, mana, but I think given this uh, board state, we're probably a little bit behind already, unfortunately. Yeah, and the Green Sun Synod uh, should be good to get Crisp out of the deck, for right. example. And but having X... Sorry, you go first. Oh, I, I was just going to say that Once Upon a Time was a very good draw there. Yeah, and, and uh, people say always, or uh, sometimes, uh, yeah, Once Upon a Time is only good in the starting hand, and you don't want to play that much of the card, but it filters also in the mid-game, and you get access to Creature or to GS Cradle. Mm -hmm. There were plenty of situations where you just found uh, your GS Cradle with the Once Upon a Time in the mid-game. Right. And then you have um, so much mana. Yeah, I, having... I, I definitely am a big fan of the card. And I almost want to play four now that we have uh, Endurance as part of our package too. Because, you know, Endurance, Reclaimer, Shepherd are all just haymakers in certain matchups. And especially with pitch cards, sometimes we can just pitch extra uh, once upon times if need be. It, it, in the late game, it's almost, I mentioned this on my previous stream, it's almost like a dig through t mini dig through time, right? Yeah, it makes sense. So here it was awkward to draw the hoof and then the second cradle, but um, 
you know, we have a small window still, but the library came down. So the problem is here in this game, um, there were plenty of situations where it was very short or slow short on the crater of Beamit, mm -hmm. but they managed to handle the board in each of the turns, so there wasn't uh, really a window to get access to the crater hoof at right. this point. I, I so, do think... And having it in the hand, it's uh, two bad cards in the hand at this stage of the game, the right. Gears Cradle and the hoof. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then um, I typically think this matchup, and I think you agreed uh, when we discussed this before, I do think this matchup is favorable to us, but you know, you, you can still lose uh, because sometimes there's variance, and then um, Anurag's also very experienced in this matchup too, so, uh, you know, there, there's very few things as a, a buy in, in Legacy, and even I've seen Elf players lose to 8-cast, so you never know, right? Yeah, I would say uh, before Modern Horizons like cards like Wrist, uh, I would say we were also favored. But at the moment, I would say it's like a 60-40 matchup for us. You talking about this matchup? Uh, it's like a 60-40 matchup for us, I would say. At oh, the moment, oh, you mean against Orsi control, right? Yeah, exactly. Right, right. Okay. I I would probably agree. That's probably pretty accurate. Um, in in the context of Legacy, the truly lopsided quote-unquote matchups are like 70-30. Like 80-20 is not really realistic, in, in my opinion. Um, except of eight casts, I would say it's like a eighty twenty. Maybe, maybe that's eighty twenty, right? <laughs> maybe even ninety ten. But <laughs> we want to be realistic. <laughs> so I think this is an interesting matchup too. Uh, I, and this was personally when I watched it, one of my favorite matchups. Uh, going through the nine rounds, um, I know DNT has specific, has been historically unfavored against Els, but uh i mentioned ma many people have mentioned john ryan hamilton other dnt players and i agree with them like it is not easy now against dnt anymore uh because you have so many dead cards game one it's very easy to lose game one like dead cards are like shepherd um like endurance bajugabog and then their dead cards they can pitch to solitude so i think that's partially why um like the Thalia's, they can just pitch the Solitude for, for tempo. So, York, did you just forget here that they could make a construct? Oh, not really. Uh, so, I knew that it's, uh, it's a very strange attack, but mm -hmm. uh, I have access to Chris anyway. And uh, I made the experience that if you um if you let them keep their constructs so their constructs will be stronger than your own creatures then right. so um trading with a single creature um with a construct keep their own or the next constructs uh, constructs in check so um they are not too strong anymore mm -hmm. so they're not like five fives for example sure so um i thought that it's uh, better for me to trade uh, especially with the access to uh, with Chris. so um, I don't want it's them to keep their construct and then attacking my Christ, for example. Okay. So I don't didn't I didn't need it to block here, um, and I had the insect anyway. So I traded one creature for that creature and kept the insects anyway. So um, I had the same amount of creatures then. Gotcha. Uh, okay, that makes more sense because when I saw that um, yesterday night, I I thought it was a strange attack, but I I figured it didn't really matter. Yeah, but if they blocked the Dryad Arbor, then I was missing an additional mana, so that could be relevant in the game. Right, but, I personally would not uh, have attacked with the Arbor, for sure. I made the experience, uh, as I said, that uh, if you... Um, if you not... Uh, I don't know how to explain that exactly. Um, the constructs get strong, so uh, if you are not having access to Wirewood Symbiote, for example, right. the constructs are able to attack either you or the uh, the Planeswalkers, uh -huh. and then you are not trading uh, favorably, I would say. So right. uh, it's that, sometimes that it's okay 
sometimes it's okay to not ha having access for them to too many constructs so they are not that strong and i've already lost games where uh, for example they had two or three five five constructs uh -huh. and then if you're not having access to why would symbiote what do we are doing against four four or six six or uh, constructs right But I didn't want it to trade to try it Arbor for for that in that situation. So right. maybe the attack was a bit greedy. So here's also a nice interaction. Um, the containment priest um, sometimes gives also a, a bit of protection for us cells because they couldn't do the Yurion flickering effects. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that really matters in the mid game. Mm -hmm. So they could uh, flicker the recruiter, for example, a couple turns later. But if they have um, containment priest in play, their creatures don't come back. So here is a situation where I was not very sure of which cards, um, or which card will they target with the council judgment. There were plenty of targets. Probably the Collector Oof was the premium target at that stage of the game. Mm -hmm. But then I was a bit confused. And uh, what I really wanted to do was uh, using Assassin's Trophy on the Spirit of the Labyrinth. Right. Then they would probably protect with Mother of Runes. And then I could respond with um, Force of Vigor, killing both. Right. And then when I did, uh, when I did that uh, and they protected, I realized that I made a mistake and even made the mistake to not handle the Spirit of the Labyrinth in this turn. Right. Yet. So I think I mentioned this. Um, it, it's good that you recognize it um, after the fact, but I mentioned in the notes that I sent to you too that I think I would have sequenced it differently because if you sequence with the Assassin's Trophy first, they're obligated to protect the Spirit of the Labyrinth and then you can go over the top with the Force of Vigor. And then not only that, they don't draw, they don't get the land off of it as well, right? It, because if you do it the other way, they get the land from the assassin's trophy. Yeah, and the and the, and the biggest problem is that they kept the spirit of labyrinth uh, in play then. Mm -hmm. um, and if I draw wildwood symbiot, for example, I couldn't have used. So now I realized, okay. Uh, now it doesn't have protection from black or green anymore. So then I used and uh, handled the spirit of the labyrinth mm -hmm. just to attack with the collector wolf. But uh, I could have did it in the in the right order in the better that they they wouldn't have access to another mana source then. Game three. I'm not sure. One of my favorite games uh, that yeah. I watched because uh, of how. How close it was at the end. Yeah, it was really close. Um, it was, yeah, it was very either close. from time wise, either from time wise and from the board state wise. So yeah, I was looking and at the clock after that. Three. After that game, uh, we were Im immediately in the top eight. So <laughs> we were the last match in the top in the tournament, mm -hmm. and then um, so at this stage of the game, I was um, seven and one. And I had very good tiebreakers mm -hmm. at, at this moment. Um, I did the math before or even while the, the match. Um, and I knew that I have 70% win percentage, mm -hmm. at least. About 70% uh, win percentage. Mm -hmm. So there was this consideration where I thought about it could be possible that I scooped that game or that match um, to have the Death in Texas um, player in the top eight. Mm -hmm. But uh, there was still a risk for me yeah, because I, I didn't risk win I and I couldn't it. rely. I tried to win, but if I lost the last game, it probably wouldn't have mattered because my good opponent scores and mm -hmm. the good start of seven and zero in the tournament as well. Mm -hmm. And Anzidi um, won his last match at, um, as well, so mm -hmm. uh, he was at ten and zero. So mm -hmm. the because of that, I had very good tiebreakers then. Uh, one thing I want to quickly um, 
One thing I want to quickly point out is you attack with the heritage but not the um, symbiote to play around the containment priest. I actually would not attack with either um, personally because I think if they block being set back on mana because it's you have to balance right it, it is actually a big downside for what it's worth. The one the one damage doesn't really matter that right. much. Correct. So one thing I wanted to, I would have played it a little. I would, but I'm also compared to you more conservative uh, in terms of my uh, play style. I will say, and sometimes um, I can be a little bit too conservative. So here's an interesting uh, situation. So I knew that I will play. Uh, I will get back the heritage druid. Uh -huh. um, I wanted to have access to natural order if I draw it. So that was the reason to um, attack with the collector oof. Right. And um, at this stage of the game, they didn't have access to any of the artifacts yet. Uh -huh. And with having access to Wirewood symbiote yet, um, Umisdama's Jitte shouldn't be that problematic for me, I assume, unless they have access to um, Pithy Needle, for example, mm -hmm. or handle both of my Wirewood symbiotes. So but I wanted to offer the trade uh, with the collector U for the. Right, I think that's one of the differences too between um, our playstyles. I personally would have not would not have a time with the collector U, but again, um, I'm on the spectrum of how aggressive. I'm probably very close to a control player, um, and sometimes that hurts me. But uh, your here is uh, putting some pressure on the opponent by attacking with both. So it depends on um, what you prefer. Uh, I'm not going to say definitively one way is correct or one way is not, but um, just something to uh, point out for the audience. Canonist is real good, by the way, against us. Yeah, Canonist isn't that played very often, I would say. Right. So it's a rare card uh, to play against, but it totally makes sense, I would say. So there are a couple of matchups where the card is good against, and even against Delver, mm -hmm. it isn't that bad, I would say. Right. Especially with the current versions. Yeah, it's. Uh, usually, um, as you might know, I'm, I'm also a very experienced as a Texas player. Mm -hmm. And um, usually played uh, another small cannonist against Blue Red Delver. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a time where there was a prowess version of it. So right. they are playing it's several ones, especially uh, with Bright Dragon, for example. And then it's good to have a card. And it also protects your creatures because um, they couldn't lightning bolt your creature. And if you um, use your mother of runes to protect, for example, they play another rune spell. Right. It isn't possible with the small cannons to play. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, it's a bit like protection for your creatures. Mm -hmm. So here now I have access to uh, the wasteland. Was nice there. Yeah, the wasteland was also important because um, it freed up my bayou. So uh, what you don't might see is that my other bayou. Uh, probably have been destroyed already and the uh, fetchland in play doesn't have any targets at this moment because a uh, containment priest is in play i couldn't fetch for uh triad arbor right but i kept it by kept i kept it uh, if i have access to avish reclaimer then you can cycle it later right so here, I would say there's also a consideration to get a Christ in play. I think it's the next thing we see. Yep. Yeah, Christ getting around Containment Priest is such a big uh, boost for a deck. Yeah. And what I usually don't like to do is um, using Christ to uptick against Death in Texas. Usually it's most of the time better to handle their hate bears. In case they draw like uh, aberration or something. Exactly. But in, uh, as I mentioned, uh, in this stage of the game, 
uh, containment priest was also protecting myself, so they couldn't use Yorion to flicker all their other creatures with enter the battlefield effects. Right, right. And we can still chunk the uh, the the germ token if need be. And uh, here in this situation, exactly the turn where I had Cradle, I don't know if they sent back their race land. I don't believe that they would send back that. But here in this uh, stage, I have about 50 seconds on my clock, so it was very close. <laughs> yeah, I, I was I was saying, I was, when I watched this, I was just thinking to myself, wow, this is very close, like, to time, too. Okay, I'm going to take a, a quick uh, restroom break, but um, I'm going to leave Jorg on in case anybody has quick questions for him about the Swiss run. Uh, before we start the topic, uh, and I'll be right back in a minute. Is that That's okay? Fine me. Sure. All right, thanks for your patience. I am back. Um, we did miss the 8-cast uh, Swiss game earlier, but York happened to play it in the uh, top 8 as well. Did anybody have any questions for York uh, before we start the top 8? I, full disclosure, I have not watched the top 8 myself, only the Swiss. So uh, here in the, in the quarterfinals, mm -hmm. um, had uh, second place after Swiss rounds, and I think um, I almost won all die rolls because uh, here in Magic Online you still have die rolls, uh -huh. not the highest withstanding decisions. Uh, who started? Uh -huh. But here in the quarterfinals, I think I won the die roll, and um, well, it looks this like was your opponent is going first, actually. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, but here in this matchup, um, I could um, search the player up before the game started. So I knew that he was playing eight cast. Mm -hmm. uh, I think my starting hand. Uh, I thought about. I thought about that I had a starting hand with two Crimson Zenits, but I'm not really sure about that. Mm -hmm. 
So I think here, personally, um, I kept the tent. I didn't know anymore. <laughs> I probably would not mow this either because you're on the draw. There's a good chance you're gonna hit your second land drop, and aside from the Archon, uh, it's actually a pretty solid hand. Uh, especially, well, it's like okay against eight cast. They don't have any pressure, so um, if you know they're on eight cast, it's probably fine. Especially since this can eventually uh, stick because of the virtual rangers. So I think keeping is fine. Yeah, the matchup is so good that keeping such um, <laughs> risky hands could help. But as they played Echo of Eons, uh -huh. everything changed anyway. So, oh, one thing I want to quickly I would point probably out. say that that Echo of Eons helped us a bit. I would say probably so. the other thing I want to point out too is um, I mentioned this before on my other streams, but given that we have the Collector Oof in the deck, and given that uh, we already have two lands, I probably fetched the Thin first before uh, Once Upon a Time. But that's a you know very nitpicky. Yeah, makes sense. So here in this situation, uh, I think it's best to have Elzor Shepherd in play first. This Agreed. disables all their counter spells. Agreed. You give them it, uh, a bit of information before that. Uh, if they have access to Chalice of the Void, they wouldn't uh, probably play that. But mm -hmm. um, sometimes, or it's possible that they even have another Echo of Eons, for example. Mm -hmm. And um, shutting down all the challenge, uh, chalices and uh, counter spells is very <coughs> valuable, I would say. Mm -hmm. So here they have a good board, I would say. Right. But our hand is uh, much stronger. Right. Especially with so many creatures in in play and then we right. have access to Wirewood Symbius to untap right. one of, of the creatures. Yeah, and then one of the scenarios that we mentioned earlier um, where we do not want to bounce our visionary. So Cage is real good against us. Yeah, definitely. So here uh, I had a, an option to extend my own board, mm -hmm. but decided to target there uh, with a saga mm -hmm. to get a bit of more time and more decisions to how the play, uh, how the game went out. Mm -hmm. And uh, with Uza saga, they would have access to construct the next turn. So I think this time walk is totally okay for us. Mm -hmm. Especially as they didn't have that much uh, cards in the hand anymore. And here's the same situation as you uh, mentioned before. Mm -hmm. There I fetched the Triad Arbor. Mm -hmm. But um, that's to get uh, more mana next turn. And um, there is also an option if I draw not. Another cradle, I can hard cast the cradle of Beamit, for example. Mm -hmm. So I wanted more creatures in play. And here with the Force of Vigor, I waited, uh, obviously, One second. I because to Crater back. Hoof. So, because what was your Crater logic for targeting the, um, the Urza Saga here? With the trophy? Um, I knew that I... Uh, I would most likely uh, cast Natural Order and get Archon of Vader's Reach. Oh, okay, that and makes they sense. have usually access to the blue spell bomb where they can bounce the creature. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to preemptively handle the, with the Saga. That's, and that that's, that's the same thing uh, we see the next turn uh, because this should be the only way how to lose the game if they have access to the spell bomb and bounce the Archon of Vader's Reach. Right. And um, we have enough, we had enough time in this situation, and Gia's Cradle is very good to hardcast the Force of Vigor. Mm -hmm. So then I um, waited until his upkeep and handled the Shadow Spear and the Ursa Saga. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, I could also maybe handle the uh, another construct. Right. But I thought that the Shadow Spear in combination with more constructs could be a way for them to to be the Archon probably. If I they agree have with that. I, I additional if the, if they have additional constructs, uh, probably it's like a seven seven, for example. Mm-hmm. Okay, it um it still has uh, to tap the creature and the Archon still has vigilance, but could be an option and the single construct in play didn't really matter at this stage because it was only a 4-4 I assume it was only a 4-4 so no that, that all of that makes uh, complete sense um, and so heads Maybe. up play by you uh, yes. thinking ahead what you could possibly again like this goes back to the philosophy you think what you can possibly lose to instead of worrying about how to win because collector oof is tip an archon or like like Runcore mentioned, right? They're almost like 11 out of 10 in the matchup. Like, it's very difficult for them to beat. And here we have the mirror. Yeah, but I did you before because um, uh, Peter van der Haven usually doesn't play elves. I, I know the player and we played a couple of times before, uh, a long time ago, uh-huh. but I never faced him against elves. I don't but think he, we... I think this was his first event with Els, but I could be wrong. I think he mentioned it on Twitter that he picked up, uh, you know, our list and admitted maybe he made worse changes to it, which is adding back the Kuhn Ranger and taking out the Once Upon a Times. But um, I think that shows the power level of this deck, right? Because as far as I know, I don't think he's ever played Els before. Here's my uh, my luck that he didn't have probably access to Cradle, mm. and I assume he probably had uh, Cradle Hoof already in hand. Mm. So he didn't have the option to get Cradle Hoof into play. Mm-hmm. He had uh, a couple of uh, looks like he's missing plays. land drops. He already missed land drops, but he had a couple plays, and he drew a bunch of cards, but he didn't drew, do anything. Uh, excited, so I assume uh, he miss, was missing land drops, and yeah. he probably maybe had a uh, crater hoof in hand already. Mm-hmm. But we couldn't really say that uh, with the information we got. Uh, my guess here... is, yeah, he's that miss the not having the once upon a time is actually costing him the game, which is kind of funny because you see the yeah. difference in deck building here, right? Yeah, and here is uh, um. Just play as many creatures plus uh, drawing as much cards as possible right. to get a best possible situation for next turn. So I knew that I couldn't win this turn. Right. But um, here we have a good example. Uh, we have enough cards, or if we untap, we definitely will win. Mm-hmm. But um, uh, they they just had the Archon, which is a really good card in the matchup. But with my hand... Uh, this is the Chris that you were talking about. I love to see it. Yeah. And that's the, it's the main reason to keep the card in the matchup <laughs> if you're playing against the Archon lists. Right, right. But that's the problem I see is uh, if Archon is already in play, you need the Chris in hand. So right, right. And usually, if not Archon is in play, Chris is a bad card to right. play. So it's just good in this scenario when Archon is already in play and you draw that's it That's really naturally. funny. It came up... Uh, 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 again, as because I watched this happen. Uh, I know we didn't show it on stream, but I watched this happen in not, the round two match against yeah. us, actually. Yeah. And it's not only the last time we see Christ in this tournament. Thank you for the follow, uh, GER Legacy. So here, um, did they just take? Oh, okay, that's why. I was gonna say why they had they multiple. Them? They had multiple multiple uh, thought seas, mm-hmm. and they decided to uh, keep the thought seas in hand mm-hmm. until turn two. Um, I usually don't play thought seas as well when I'm on the play, but on the draw, especially if they started with dried arbor, I think it's okay to play thought seas. 
In general, I would agree with that. I think in this matchup, there's no way of dying on turn one. So I typically, if I'm going to play, I won't lead with Aussies either. But I think it's a little bit dangerous, especially against the Nettle version, to not play Thossies uh, at least on the play if you're on, sorry, if you're on the draw and then you're, you're on your first turn. Newton, can you please pause the video for a second? Yes. So, um, yeah, um, oh, when I played the first game, I didn't see any of the core cards, I would say, so I didn't already knew if they are playing Nettle Sentinel version or the Reclaimer version. Uh -huh. So um, I had to assume, uh, because I saw the Quirin Ranger, that they probably are the Nettle Sentinels uh, version. I would, with the with I, would, I would make the same they assumption. Also, yeah. And they are also Arc, uh, versions with Arc on it, uh, with it like uh, I think Testacular plays uh, lists like that. Mm -hmm. So um, there was a, sa a safer play to just play the Thoughtseize and discarding their Glimpse, for example, if they have it. Right. But here in this situation, uh, we see it wasn't that easy for me and I uh, didn't came to a conclusion uh, afterwards mm -hmm. if it's uh, better to attack the grids there or attack them. But um, I decided to, t to attack them uh, because it had the, probably the most upside for me because they were 15 life. Mm. So uh, when I made the attack, um, I think uh, when I'm attacking him, they could assume that I have... Uh, Crop rotation because I have the mana up exactly. Uh -huh. um, but if I attack the Grist, um, I could uh, probably kill the Grist in the next turn. But then I could also die from him, t top decking, for example, Natural Order. Right. So here I decided that it's more likely for him to block if I'm attacking him. If he's not blocking at all, so I get my GS Cradle and he takes 15. And if he blocks, he at least loses, loses um, at least loses one or two creatures for this turn, mm -hmm. which sets him back in mana. No, I, I I agree with this attack on him only because they can kill your uh, shepherd anyways if they tick down. So oh sorry, they would have to tick down to kill your shepherd anyways. So it's mostly upside here. Um, you, should I continue? No, no, I said everything I wanted to, to explain for that. Um, I think both plays are possible, but if I, if we attack Grist, we give him in free turn, for example. Right. No, I, I think then... you definitely want to pressure the life there because uh, for the reasons we stated. And he could he could easily just let him die or let the Grist die, um, just not block it, and exactly. then. They they have they don't have a bad situation there. If they if they get access to GS Cradle, for example, mm -hmm. they can also use the Shepherd for by themselves, mm -hmm. and um, because they are set, uh, get set back with creatures here, oh. they are so ma so so ma so much behind mm -hmm. that they needed to use the Gris to handle the Shepherd. So right. I think it's thing, totally... though, um, you had a window where you could hit the Bayou. Um, I personally would probably do that because you're already ahead. Um, but yeah, would you just save I did it for the cradle. I did that. Uh, I did that next turn uh -huh. um, because I didn't want them to get uh, or or made it less likely. Now I'm really far ahead as I have uh, Wirewood Symbiote and Visionary. Right. So. Here is a situation where I just need two turns, for example, right. to find the right cards. And then it's the right time to attack their mana and their upkeep. Right. Just to... Um, put them off, right. Put them off mana, exactly. Just to get a bit of time. Yeah, I, I think, like I said, um, there was a window earlier we could hit the thing without them getting it back. But I don't think it really matters uh, too much here. And then we drew the glimpse, so that's probably just game over here. Yeah, that's what I also thought about uh, when I saw the glimpse. Right. Oh, we have insurance too, uh, with the um, the Thassi. Actually, their their card in hand is it the Arbor? 
No, they, 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 no, they, they, they sacrifice they sacrifice the arbor to Christ. Right. To handle my shepherd. Right. That, okay. Um, I don't know if everything is fine by you, but my um, stream video lagged a bit, but now it's working again. I think it's okay now. Um, we we took the one card in hand as insurance. Uh, makes sense that it was a hook because it can't cast it, but we're we're pretty already far ahead here. So usually I have problems by playing the S mirror, I would say. So, um, so not only the Natal Sentinel versions. So, so sometimes we play each other and uh, also against other S players. Most uh -huh. of the times I had problems to play the matchup. Uh -huh. I think. But in this tournament it uh, went very good. Uh, yeah, you faced it uh, two times. I personally wouldn't put too much weight into the mirror, like your whatever your win rate is, because I think a lot of it is just luck, to be honest. Because my win rate against the mirror, whether you know the traditional build or our build, it doesn't really make any sense either. Because I think I'm like at least I mean I don't I don't calculate obviously, but I think it's probably above sixty percent against the Nettle version, and I don't think that's actually what it's supposed to be. It's probably closer to like, you know, 47, 53 or something because I would say they have a slight, slight edge in that they they're a little bit faster, but uh, typically whoever has natural order wins. So again, it's kind of like whoever goes first and has natural order. So here in this, this is the finals for, for uh, information. Mm -hmm. So here I had access to um, two graveyard interactions, which mm -hmm. was very helpful to just um, get the Uru in exile. Mm -hmm. And the endurance could be used later, um, either to, to target myself or target them, right. or just to have an... Uh, it, there's a cool situation uh, a couple of turns later, <laughs> because they attack with um, Leowald, uh -huh. and then I cast endurance. And they need to force of will that. Right, that's actually keep the Leobold alive. So here in this situation, they had zero cards in hand, uh -huh. and then I knew that um, my natural order will be resolving most likely. Right. And then they take Yurion in hand, and they made the uh, mistake to play the land. Oh, that's so a game losing mistake where they attack with the uh, Leo there, yeah. But I mean, I don't blame them because endurance is a one of. Yes, it does. Play one Endurance main deck, uh, Dragon Dawn. Wow, yep. what a clutch uh, draw Endurance was there. It's like randomly good, right, Jorg? Exactly, especially in the control um, matchups. Um, it's also a good way to pressure Planeswalkers, for example. And um, if you have a patch land, they can assume that you get the Dryad Arbor and have one damage, but Endurance can attack for three damage, so... It makes a big difference, for example, against cards like Jace or Manscaptor. If they are brainstorming, then you can kill it with endurance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, that well, that was a you know game saving uh, block there because otherwise they can force the natural order. But now we know the coast is clear. So here in this game, they're trying to deny my mana, mm -hmm. but I have uh, enough mana sources in hand, mm -hmm. or access to enough mana sources. Right. Here I assume in the end step I use once upon a time to get more creatures, uh -huh. getting uh, why I would symbiote. Mm -hmm. um, here I can not uh, reliably uh, draw multiple cards, but uh, it's more like a bait to play the of nature here to get the counter spell out of the hand or probably counter spell out of the hand mm -hmm. and um, yeah, Chris in hand this is a really payoff I would say in this mm -hmm. situation no so, that, that definitely uh, looks like it, it paid off because I probably would have led with the wire so I can draw the play the visionary again but yeah I think you're gonna be able to resolve the grist so that, that was pretty uh, pretty good and there are, the there other are way, source of negation. 
Yeah. And on the other way, force of negation wouldn't be able to counter the grist anyway, but right. uh, I but would it put it on the force of will. Exactly. So here in this game, you see, um, if you get back for a couple of seconds, please, uh, yeah. you can see that Endurance took his whole graveyard out of control. So they had multiple wastelands in the graveyard and uh, I assume probably mm -hmm. also an Euro. So, and on top of that, it's uh, also a 3-4 creature. Let me actually, so they have Uro. Let me actually, uh, what is it called? Freeze it on that exact turn when you're about to do it. All right, so when you're doing it, they have a I can't, preordained ponder, wasteland, prismatic ending, oak, uh, Uro, windswept heath, and... Uh, sword. So this is a huge play here because uh, you stop Uro from hitting, hitting the board and you just nuke their yard so future Uros are not going to matter for a while. Exactly. And on top of that Endurance is also a 3-4 creature mm -hmm. and a good clock to pressure the opponent. And the card did its, uh, its chip damage, for sure. Here I don't attack because I uh, feared a bit of Containment Priest mm -hmm. or maybe even Ice Fang Kotal. Right. So I wanted to keep the Visionary, especially with the Crater Hoof in hand, because if we draw a Cradle, every creature we have in play counts. So mm -hmm. I don't want it to lose. Uh, and here it's very good to have access to Chris to handle the Yurion mm -hmm. and just attack for 7. Mm -hmm. So they were at 14 and now they are at 7. Mm -hmm. So very, very much behind. And then I can uh, attack with uh, Endurance additionally. Mm -hmm. There are additionally 3 damage for them. Mm -hmm. and they could have blocked, but uh, probably they fear a bit about Elizabeth Shepard, for example, or, uh, or Visionary. Right. Right. Okay. But they were so much behind in this situation, so... And just needed... Uh... So here I decided to defend the Grist with the Insect. Mm -hmm. um, Grist is also an insurance. If something goes wrong, if they are probably get... Uh, toxic deluge, for example, or any strange sweeper. No, I think uh, I think this matchup kind of shows, and we 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 discussed this personally. Um, Plague engineer not very good good against us actually, um, as shown in this matchup, right? Like it can steal games, but not by itself. Like the days of casting three drop plague engineer to try to you know win the game on the spot against elves doesn't really exist. All right, so that concludes the oops. That concludes the wrap up. Um, let me close this. Does anybody want to, uh, you know, discuss any, any of the previous matches? I'll bring it back up. Uh, one second. Uh, here is the playlist again. Or if anybody has any just questions for Jorg. Um, that works too. All right, so here are the matchups. Uh, Jorg overall played 12 rounds, went 11 and 1. I mean, very, very impressive. There's nothing uh, else you can say but that it was impressive. Uh, you know, there are certain spots that we would play a little bit differently because uh, I think Jorg is a little bit more aggressive than I am naturally, uh, and that's, you know, totally fine. Uh, our list was 74 out of 75, so the only difference was he played a crop rotation over the third force of vigor. Crop rotation was my 76 card, so it just barely missed it, uh, but more or less Jorg and I always consult when uh, discussing deck lists. Is there anything you want to add to that, Jorg, or no? Uh, no, I, I'm... 
Also when I when I made uh, choose my decklist for the event, uh, we were in contact and wrote uh, the previous days and uh, discussed about about uh, which decks we want to face against or which decks we want to beat. So we were both the opinion that Lance is one of the most important matchups we have to put on our map. And um, the main reason, so I decided to get the crop rotation was to get an additional edge to have against Doomsday and in the mirror. And um, I also feel very safe uh, with access to crop rotation and wasteland against lands to have a good way to handle dark steps. Mm -hmm. That but on sense. top of that, I wouldn't cha change any of the cards in the list. Um, I thought about uh, the progenitors because <laughs> <laughs> in some testing games, in some testing games, uh, I played against um, Ali. It's um, Albert Lindblom, the lens player. Uh -huh. So we tested the matchup um, a couple of days before Eternal Weekend, and I thought about. Uh, I believe it was uh, it were three games. Where I naturally drew the progenitors, and I explained uh, at the beginning that the uh, most thing uh, thing I don't like with the deck is drawing progenitors. <laughs> so I even thought about cutting it for the third um, force of Vigor. Uh -huh. But uh, good that I kept the card in the deck because it did a great job in the tournament and it sealed the deal in the finals. I would say so. Uh, when I had access to progenitors, uh, the game was little really over. Mm -hmm. um, I think there wasn't really a card uh, they could beat uh, the progenitors with, and it had to be something strange uh, like terminus powerful. or supreme verdict. But you're playing green sun deck, so that doesn't make any sense. Exactly. Um, so a quick. A common question that gets asked by, uh, I think it's K-A-W-L-L-I-E, uh, Kalai, is, is there data on how much slower if actual slower the Reclaimer version is? So, um, I want to debunk some of the myths that are out there about how much slower the, the version is. There's no turn twos with the deck, uh, as Runcor uh, Inigo uh, mentioned, but the amount of times the turn two comes up is actually very low anyway. If you're talking about the full-on glimpse kill, uh, this, the turn twos that I, that this deck has are more like lock pieces, so you can get turn two um, either collector oof or turn two uh, turn two collector oof, turn two uh, off natural or archon, or turn two uh, reclaimer against a graveyard deck, for instance. Those are like the pseudo turn twos that we have, but in terms of full comboing, the earliest this deck can win is turn three. Uh, the yeah, app and uh, we can also, sorry, sorry, Newton, uh, and we also can win on turn zero. <laughs> yes, we can turn on turn, turn zero with the endurance. Exactly. Um, so I would say the average kill turn is probably, uh, so the average kill turn, I think, of the normal build is maybe turn three. I think we're probably three and a half, but our three and a half is usually through disruption too. Like... It's not uncommon to win on turn three or four through Force of Will or through removal. Uh, whereas I think the other version, that the traditional list, it's it's more difficult to win through uh, disruption in my in my opinion. At least on consistently win through it. Like I think they can eventually grind out if they get the Visionary and Wirewood up, but um, it's not nearly as resilient uh, against hate uh, as ours in my opinion. Uh, anything you yeah, I would agree. So I would agree, uh, and uh, I can't speak that much about Nettle Sentinel S because I didn't play it that much, uh, so much like the Reclaimer versions, but I definitely tried it out. And uh, from my perspective, is like uh, Nettle Sentinel is more like a glass cannon deck. So you have a very straightforward plan, and you can execute it reliably. I would say. If you're not getting disrupted, um, if your creatures get disrupted, uh, the reclaimer version is much more resilient because each of our creatures isn't that high importance for the main plan. And especially like Elvish Reclaimer is very good on its own. If you're comparing Nettle Sentinel and Elvish Reclaimer on an empty board, 
and it's your only creature, uh, Nettle Sentinel most of the times is just a um, grizzly bear, but uh, Avish Reclaimer is a utility creature and gives you uh, much options or even uh, an option against unfair decks like uh, graveyard decks. And a 3 4 body is very um, important to have. You have also very, uh, sometimes you have games where you have multiple average reclaimer, which are 3 4, and then you are attacking just for 6, or even if you have 3 4 9, and it's a much faster clock on their own, in uh, opposite to the Nettle Sentinel. But you definitely give some percentages also against some combo decks like Sneak and Show, for example. That could be an option to have access to Nettle Sentinel because you can go crazy on turn 2, for example, or turn 3 mm -hmm. with Allosaurus Shepherd. And you can have more explosive wins like... Um, <laughs> the turn 2, right. The turn... Exactly. Um, I will but say... As long as you're disrupted, it's very hard for the Nettle Sentinel version. And um, disrupting, disrupting the creatures of the Reclaimer version isn't that effective, I would say. But we are a bit um, weaker if our land mana base is disrupted. So, right. Because we have, less, um, we have less elves which tap for mana and less heritage, for example. So less que no Korean Rangers. No Korean Rangers as well. But... Um, I definitely prefer the Reclaimer version because you have more, a bit of interactive games and Reclaimer is also one of my favorite creatures in Magic, so there's no two opinions from my side uh, that I decide for Reclaimer over on Little Sentinel. Something I want to mention that um, is probably apparent from the, the finals match we just watched right now, our opponent had a Plague Engineer. Um, if Reclaimer were a Nettle Sentinel there, um, technically it would live through it, but then they can attack into our Gris. So I think being a 2-3 uh, in the face of an Engineer is actually very important because uh, for two reasons. One, we can continue to attack through it if need be, uh, if, if they're low on life already. Or two, to protect our uh, Planeswalker, specifically Gris, in the matchup. Um, and doesn't allow them to continue to pressure us because... If we want to, we can trade. Um, we're not playing it at the moment, but Cabal Pit is always a reasonable option. And that was probably our 77th card that we were considering uh, for the event. Uh, let me think if there's something else that I'm missing. One other thing that I want to mention is... <coughs> yeah, so Nero said no, even though it lives through uh, Plague Engineer, uh, it's really only effective if you have Birch Lore and Heritage out, and neither of them live through Plague Engineer. So the only thing it can do in the face of an Engineer is be the pitch card for Natural Order. But aside from that, um, generally much less resilient and uh, in a vacuum much uh, less powerful than, uh, than Elvish Reclaimer. I never got to ask your opinion, Jord, um, but I think I already know the answer, and I know what my answer would be. Uh, something that gets asked a lot is why play this version over the Nettle Sentinel version, uh, or, or over why play Reclaimer over Nettle Sentinel, and I think the framing of the question is um, not correct. It's To me, Elvish Reclaimer is the strongest creature in the deck, and I ask myself, do I want to play the strongest creature in the deck? Similar to if you're a blue player, do you want to play Brainstorm? And the answer is yes, for me. Uh, York, do you feel this way, or do you think Allosaurus Shepherd is the strongest creature in the deck? Mm, I would say it depends on the matchup. It's, uh, but um, Reclaimer is the strongest creature against the most important matchups, I would say. That's fair. This, for example, uh, Delver. includes Delver, Lance, and even death in Texas, mm -hmm. um, just to get access to additional GS Cradles. So, um, so with the normal um, Nettle Sentinel versions, for example, uh, you have access to Cradle, 
usually you find one, especially if you're glimpsing and uh, drawing four or five creatures. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, playing four or five creatures. But if your one um, cradle is handled, then you can probably wait for several turns or you will never see a cradle again. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's not that important because you have enough else and they produce mana anyway. Right. And you can, and you have more untap. But um, having access to as much cradles as you want or as you might need is a very strong uh, ability of the Reclaimer. And it also includes additional lands you can play if you want to. So in our current list, we just don't play any other utility lands except for the Bujuka Bog and the Wasteland because the format doesn't need to. But there were already times where we played, for example, Caracas. And Caracas is also a very good card against our, our um, harder or worst matchups, for example, like Lands or Sneak and Show and Depth. Reanimator, right, potentially. And Reanimator as well. Right. So you have the utility, and, uh, especially if new uh, um, ability Lands uh, should be printed. Um, it could be inclusion in our deck, or at least in the sideboard. Mm -hmm. So... It gives more utility to the deck. You can also thin out the deck uh, by fetching um, fetch lands, for example, mm -hmm. and then in the end step, uh, sacrificing the fetch land, get another fetch land. Or if you have enough mana, you can use both of reclaimers or combine it with uh, wirewood symbiotes so you thin out your deck and you draw more business spells by that. Right, right. Another one that um, we kind of briefly touched about, that is a utility then that is uh, not played at the moment, but definitely a consideration is the Cabal Pit. Um, the reason why we're not playing right now is because it doesn't line up well against Delver uh, in its current state, uh, but it is very effective against decks like Death and Taxes and Plague Engineer uh, decks. Um, there was something I was going to mention too, that we, oh, I remember now. So Jorg brought up that, uh, had a great answer in which is the better card and he said it depends on the matchup so i wanted to quickly say that reclaimer and allosaurus shepherd being completely different cards and having different strengths and weaknesses i believe is a good thing here because uh as a general rule of thumb i think they tend to be good when the other is not so what i mean by that is uh reclaimer obviously york mentioned the best matchups are um, DNT, uh, Elvo, yes. Delver for sure, uh, re graveyard decks. The match like Hogarth, Hogarth, for example, or Dredge, yeah. Or Dredge, right. The, the, the matches where Del uh, Reclaimer is not good against tend to be like Doomsday, Sneak and Show. Sneak and Show. And, huh? Yeah, correctly. Uh, Doomsday and Sneak and Show are the best example where uh, Elsor of the and also the Shepherd shines because um, they can counter your business spells. Exactly. So, um, yeah. So that was a great answer by York saying that it depends on the matchup. And I think it's a good thing that they have, they're very different cards. And thus, uh, when one is good, the other one, sorry, when one is not particularly good, the other one tends to be. So um, we didn't face it, or York didn't play, play against it this uh, event, but I actually won my winning in against Doomsday, and Alice Sword Shepherd is the most important creature in that matchup, by far. Um, and the reason being is because you have an unprotected, you have a protected, sorry, uh, endurance or a protected assassin trophy if they uh, go for turn one Dark Ritual Doomsday, for instance. Yeah, and um, uh, with Elsor Shepherd, I want to explain. Uh, I had another example with some other mates uh, a couple of days before when I had to describe the power of the card. Um, it gives you a virtual card advantage because, depending on the hand of your opponent, they couldn't ever use all their or any of their counter spells they have in hand. So, in specific situations, uh, you can imagine like if you are playing a Him to Turok for just a green mana with the ability that every other creatures uh, couldn't be or the other spells couldn't be countered anymore and on top, on top of that it doesn't happen that often but uh, it happens often enough that you are just pumping your team 
-hmm. and attacking for 15, for example. So you get free wins with Elizabeth Shepard as well by pumping the team. Um, and it also helps against the prison matchups like Moonstorm P or uh, Khan Echo and Eldrazi, for example. Eight so they have access to and eight cast. They have access to Chalice and um, and Snaren Bridge, for example. Mm -hmm. And you can beat both cards with the Shepherd. Yeah, I I think what's nice too, and extra bonus points if you are able to do this is. Reclaimer's ability to get Gaia's Cradle means that uh, you can attack with 7-7s seven now. So um, it comes up every once in a while. It didn't come up in our... Uh, I don't think it... Actually, I don't think it came up today in the uh, our review of the Eternal Weekend event. But I'm sure it's come up for Jorg a few times where he gets to attack with, you know, either one or multiple 7-7s. Uh, seven Several times, yes. <laughs> So with that said, I think that concludes our uh, you know stream. Uh, I definitely want to do this again with Jorg, um, you know, at the next convenience when the time is correct. Uh, for those who are interested, here is Jorg's playlist once again um, for his Eternal Weekend event, um, and make sure to follow him on Twitter uh, if you aren't already. His uh, username is one second. Are you, do you go about Aaron Relentless or, or your on your Twitter? Uh... No, uh, so my Twitter username is Aaron underline Relentless. Okay, here it is. I'll post it on the, the chat. So, um, you know, follow York. He's a great guy. I've enjoyed working um, and developing this deck over the past, uh, ever since he picked it up, I think it was last March. Um, for those of you who are curious, uh, after the initial picking up of the deck, he top eight his first uh, challenge only a week and a half later. So, uh, Yori is definitely uh, very talented with the deck. Um, and I do want to mention actually, uh, since I know a lot of people associate the deck building of, uh, with me, uh, I do want to highlight while we're uh, we have Yori here some of his contributions from a deck building perspective. Uh, uh, with the stream. So I'll bring up the list. Uh, one second. The stream decker list. So here is. Um, oops, wrong one. Here is the list on stream decker. And uh, this is your exact configuration for uh, EW. Uh, again, only off by one card of mine. The one thing I will say is. Um, York has been a big proponent of the crop rotation in the cyborg, and I try to fit it in when I can because it's so flexible. But of note, um, I know we happen to have the uh, endurance come up in the top eight, uh, it, actually in the finals, where we got to uh, exile the entire yard, or not exile, shuffle back in the entire yard with our natural. Or, oh, sorry, we did that game too, but we got to naturally block the. Leovold that drew a force in game one and that was only possible because for a long time I ran the one career ranger and it was actually Yorg's recommendation that we can live without it like having a bigger sideboard is more important to elves because our harder matchups tend to be combo and if that means we lose the ability to tutor for queen ranger every once in a while that's something we can li lose uh live with so to speak and uh, I wanted to highlight that because that was Jorg's recommendation. Uh, so we went from 4 to 1 Queer Ranger, and then finally the step from going to 1 to 0 was Jorg's recommendation. Um, another thing that Jorg has done is he has been a big advocate of the second Birch Lord instead of the fourth. Um, or just in general, like instead of shaving all of the Birch Lords before shaving the Heritage, because there used to be four of each. And then we went to 4-3 once, with Once Upon a Time. And that's when Yorg, um, you know, started learning the deck. And then when Alistair Shepard got added, we went to 3-2. and two, And Yorg has always been a big proponent of keeping the second Birch Lord because it's almost like a Mana Dork. And it also is actually secretly better than Heritage in a lot of post-board matchups because you don't have to overextend and you get your re return on investment immediately. Uh, 
Anything you would like to add, uh, York? Uh, maybe I'm forgetting something, but those are the ones I tend to remember from a deck building perspective that you've, uh, yep. you know, been a yep. big a major player. Because uh, okay, by, uh, with Virtual Rangers, uh, I think you teached me at the beginning when I played the deck. So uh, Virtual Rangers is uh, stronger uh, than the Heritage Druid. So I uh, noticed that from the beginning. And um, I also would say that it's very important because uh, the mana fixing of Virtual Rangers is so important, especially because we are not playing a Savannah anymore. Mm -hmm. And I want a uh, valid um, opportunity to cast an um, Archon of Valor's Reach from our hand. Mm -hmm. And it even helps uh, with post-board games. There are plenty of situations where you just play two elves and then you tap both elves and cast Thoughtseize on the opponent. Right. So this helps, uh, really helps against the control and also against the combo matchups. Yep. And another another uh, common uh, play pattern I want to explain or uh, even highlight it, um, especially against DMT, it's very helpful to have virtual rangers because you can play it as a morph creature. And then the opponent couldn't um, attack with the creature um, and then give it protection from green if they have a Musava's Jitter, for example, to um, let the creature through. So then if you have the mana additionally and the Wirewood Symbiote, okay, you have to need uh, very much of mana to do that, but it's possible to just morph the uh, Virtual Rangers, then block it, uh, the creature, Unmorph it and then bounce it with Wirewood Symbiote so you are protected against Umis Java's Jitte and Mother of Runes, for example. Right, That's a, that actually comes up a, a good amount too because uh, uh, DNT is very popular at the moment because of their favorable matchup against uh, Blue Red Delver or just Blue Red Variants in general. So, something to look out for. Uh, did, did you. Um, want to add anything else, Jorg, or does the chat have any questions for myself or Jorg? I think I've uh, plugged, you know, your uh, Twitter handle and your YouTube uh, playlist already. Uh, if you haven't, make sure to, you know, subscribe to his YouTube channel because I'm sure he'll uh, upload more videos in the future. Um, I'm also going to upload this stream on YouTube myself, so if you haven't, please follow me if you enjoy uh, my content. Um, but I think otherwise, if chat has no questions or if York has no other comments, um, that probably wraps up our stream. So I guess uh, going once, going twice, uh, three times, I guess. Um, so York, I think we call it a day. What? <laughs> I think we call it a day. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, so it's been a great pleasure uh, having you for the first time. I know it's been a long time uh, since we first discussed doing this, but... Um, you know, I'm very thankful, you know, in the uh, Thanksgiving uh, spirit to have, uh, you know, a great legacy community and, uh, you know, be able to work on this deck with you uh, over the past year and a half. It has been a pleasure for me as well. And uh, thanks for having me and thanks for the idea. So it would be nice if we could repeat it at, it, uh, at another time. And I'm sure that we get another opportunity to do it again. And... I'm looking forward for that. Okay, and then with that said, I uh, want to congratulate you one more time on winning the Bayou painting. Uh, it's a it's a well deserved um, achievement that that you that you've been working on, uh, or that's been in the process. I would say within the last year and a half because of the time you put in. Uh, I mentioned this before in other streams, but besides me, I think Yorg has more reps than any other player on this deck, and far more reps i should say um so thank you i think right now we'll go ahead and uh you know raid mana symbol and then uh call it a day um so again thanks everybody for tuning in i hope they've enjoyed this review of the uh stream uh york's videos on youtube for anybody who wants to catch it or catch this stream um i'll also upload this on on youtube uh, or if you want it immediately, it's already on Twitch uh, replay. So uh, I think, uh, you know, enjoy the rest of Thanksgiving for those of you in the U.S. the, the weekend. And then uh, until next time, I guess. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.